Before we dive into this course, I want to talk about a day in the life of an ethical hacker. And I want to talk about why I love ethical hacking or penetration testing and what I do on a day to day basis, what kind of engagements you might find yourself in as an ethical hacker, and then the soft skills and technical skills I think that you should have in order to be successful in this field. So let's go ahead and first look at why pen testing. So why pen testing? Why for me? Well, I work from home. Uh, I roll out of bed at like 7.55 in the morning. I'll get my coffee ready. I'll go to my desk. I'll make it there by eight and I am ready to go. I don't have to sit in traffic. I don't have to drive to work. I, you know, I save so much time out of my life just by working from home. It's a great luxury. I love the lifestyle. It's not for everybody, but a lot of penetration testing nowadays is working from home. And another great thing about pen testing is the salaries are incredibly high. Uh, my first job in the field was over six figures, meaning over a hundred thousand dollars in this field as a you know, first year pen tester. Uh, so it's incredible money and it the, it's very lucrative moving up. Anywhere from uh, a senior pen tester can make $150,000, a manager can make somewhere around one hundred and seventy dollars to $200,000. And really the sky's the limit, especially if you go out and you do your own business or your own consulting. Uh, the salaries are very, very high because this is a very technical field and uh, they're, there is a job shortage or people shortage right now. We need we have more jobs than we have people. So that relates to high salaries as well. On top of that, the benefits are great. The work life balance is great. Again, this boils down to where you work. But uh, for for me personally, you know, I'm working 40 hour weeks. Um, my benefits are, are have been fantastic through and through. Um, and I just I love the lifestyle, right? That work from home, that 40 hours a week. I was an accountant before I got into penetration testing. And let me tell you, I was working 60 hour weeks, 70 hour weeks. I was in the office at the, all the time. And I was, you know, I was going in when it was dark and I was coming home when it was dark. And it just, you know, can easily lead to depression doing that. I've not experienced any of that in penetration testing. And I am really, really happy for it. So on top of all this, it is mentally stimulating. This is one of the best fields. I am what I, I consider a lifelong learner. I like to learn. I am nonstop learning, right? And I have that personality type. And you're going to find that if you enjoy this field, it's never going to feel like work to you. I could sit here and I can pen test for 80 hours and it never feels like work to me. It is just mentally stimulating. It's a puzzle. There's always something new to learn. There's always a new attack out. And there's always a new defense out as well. So somebody's always trying to uh, block your attacks. And it's this cat and mouse game. And if you do not stay up to date or on top of things, you're going to get left behind. So you have to have that mentality in this field where you're always willing to learn and you like learning. And that's really like, for me, that's a positive to pen testing because I enjoy that. And lastly, of course, it's legal breaking and entering. Who doesn't like that? I get to break into buildings. I get to break into websites, into networks, and people pay me to do it. I cannot believe that this is a job. When I first heard about it, I was like, no way. Hackers, hackers are bad guys, right? But hackers can be good guys too, and we can get paid very lucrative salaries. So from here, let's talk about a day-to-day -day lifestyle. So day-to-day -day here. What's guaranteed, most <laughs> basically should be guaranteed, is that I roll out of bed. I'm still relatively young. And I have several different types of assessments that I can do. And this really isn't all of them, but this is the ones that I do the most. Now, I have what is an external or internal network assessment, and we're going to cover those quite a bit in this course. But when we're talking external network assessment, that means that I'm evaluating a network from the outside. I could be... I could be in China, I can be in the United States, I could be in Russia. It doesn't matter where I'm attacking from, right? I could be in any country at any time attacking this network. So I'm on the outside looking in. The internal is different. We assume at this point that we have breached the network. We have a Dropbox. We've got some sort of code execution on their network. We logged into their VPN. It doesn't matter. Somehow, some way, we're on that network. 
what can we do once we're inside the network? And what that means is we're going to be talking a lot about Active Directory pen testing, and that's really what it corresponds to. And this course is going to hit very, very heavy on Active Directory because of this. And uh, this, so you have two different types of network pen tests, and they the methodology is very similar. The attacks and tool sets are very different. Uh, so they can almost be split apart into their own subsections. But you will have external pen tests, internal pen tests on the network side. You may be asked to do web application penetration testing. So that is assessing a website, right? You, you have a website or an application that is given to you, and you want to see if you can break that website, if you can log in as an administrator or get somewhere that you, you shouldn't be able to get to, and you just want to evaluate the security posture of that website. So there are a lot of tools and methodologies out there for that, and we're going to cover the OWASP top 10 in this course when we talk about that, which is big when it comes to testing web applications. So from there, we also have what is called wireless penetration testing. That is the evaluation of a wireless network. So we'll go on site, we'll try to hack into the wireless, we'll look at the guest network and see if there's any segmentation or not. Should a guest be able to sign in and access the same network that somebody who is logged in as an employee should access? The answer is no, but it happens quite a bit. We'll also look for rogue devices and see, you know, what might be out there that is interesting to us. Well, we'll talk more about all these different assessments when we get into their respective sections. Now, there's also what is called physical or social or phishing. There are three different types, but they fall into social engineering. Now, physical assessment is where you go on site and you try to break into a building. You have a destination in mind, maybe it's a server closet or, you know, some some critical location in the building that they don't want you to get into. This could involve picking locks, social engineering a lot of the time, uh, cloning badges, you know, and just making your way into this building through whatever methodology you can. Now, social engineering uh, and phishing, those are, you know, kind of hand in hand. You'll do a phishing campaign or a social engineering campaign or even a vishing where you're calling on the phone and you're trying to get information and you're just after, you know, what kind of credentials can I get? Uh, who clicks on my links? What kind of passwords do I get, etc. We also have what is called SOC assessment. Uh, so a SOC assessment is also known as purple teaming and purple teaming is when you combine red and blue. So as a penetration tester or ethical hacker, you're often known as red and a defender is often known as blue. So you combine those and that makes purple. And what that means is we'll sit down with a blue team as an offensive team, we'll sit down with a blue team and we'll say, hey, what attacks do you want us to try to run? Or we're gonna run these attacks and I wanna know if you pick it up. So I might run a specific attack and see if the blue team detects it. I might go plug into their network and see if it pre prevents me from plugging into their network. Do they get an alert on that? If not, how can we help them baseline this attack to get this alert? So I think purple teaming assessments are some of the best assessments that are out there because not only do they learn from you and what attacks are out there, but you learn from them on how to defend against these and how to bypass these too because maybe your first attempt does get blocked and you're like, hey, maybe I should you know, run a different attack and see if you catch that. And it's a great way to have that cat and mouse game again. So once we do these types of assessments, we have to write a report. We have to report back on what we saw and tell the client about it. And I put a little sad face there because, you know, not everybody likes writing reports, but it is absolutely part of the job. You have to be well written in this field to be successful. So, you know, you write this report and you're going to have to present this report to a client. And that's what is the debrief. Now, a debrief is where you take the report and you give it to a client and you walk through it with the client and say, here's what's wrong, here's why it's wrong, and here's how we can fix that for you, or here's how you can fix that, right? And so you have to have this technical skill set as a penetration tester, and you have to have this well-written skill set. You have to be able to write well. You also have to be able to talk in front of people when it comes to doing debriefs and talk to people. That doesn't mean you have to be an extrovert by any means. You can be an introvert. I am very introverted, but you have to be able to put that personality on when you're on site. Same thing with the, the physicals, by the way. If you're on site for a physical, you do not have to be an extrovert to be successful. I know plenty of good physical 
uh, pen testers that are actually introverts and do just fine as long as you're able to get into that mindset for that temporary time period. So anywhere from all these different assessments that you could end up doing at any given time, you have to be well-rounded there. You're going to be writing reports and you're going to be presenting reports to clients. Now let's talk about the technical skills that you are going to need. And our course here is going to cover a lot of these. So at a base level, you really do need to know Linux, preferably Kali Linux or what another type was called Parrot. There is networking that you should know. You should be familiar with the OSI model, certain protocols like TCP, UDP, HTTP, etc. You should have good scripting skills, whether it be Python scripting or Bash scripting, etc. There, and you should have a solid hacking methodology. And this is all what we would want as a base for an interview. You should have also tool familiarity, right? Metasploit, Burp Suite, Nessus. If all this sounds like a foreign language to you, that's fine. Come back and watch this video again once you've gone through the whole course and it's going to all click for you and you're going to say, hey, I know a lot of this. And on the preferred side, Active Directory is huge. If you know Active Directory, you're going to be ahead of the game. Most people, when I interview them, they have a good base, but they don't have that good preferred side. And we like we like the preferred column a lot. OK, uh, so Active Directory, super important. Wireless attacks, important to know. The OWASP top 10, also important to know. That is related to web application penetration testing. And lastly, coding skills. So scripting and coding, a little bit different. Scripting is what you'll be using primarily. Coding, you don't have to be a coder to be successful in this field at all, by the way. If you only script for the rest of your life in this field, you'll still find plenty of success. However, you can code new tools things, you know, contribute to the community with it. Um, we'll talk about that here in a second as well. But just know that the base is possibly potentially can get you into a job to preferred will definitely get you into a job if you have strong knowledge on that side, along with the base knowledge. Lastly, something that is not covered uh, much is the soft skills that you need to be a pen tester. So yeah, it's great to be technical. And we already talked about the, the social people skills, right? Because you're going to be doing that debriefing. You might be doing social engineering, et cetera. And you're going to have to have that well-written ability to you as well. But let's talk about some of these other ones. You need a strong desire to learn. You should be the type of person or that personality type that always wants to learn. We talked about it, right? Where you should be the guy or girl that wants to go home and study. And you find this fascinating in you that desire to learn is going to benefit you because of that cat and mouse game, because, you know, something that you knew yesterday might not be uh, an exploit today. You know, patches are coming out all the time and you have to stay ahead of the game because of this cat and mouse game. So that strong desire to learn, super important. If you do not stick up with your studies, you're going to get left behind. And most people have this desire to be in the field of ethical hacking because they think it's sexy. It sounds cool and it is cool. But if you do not have that desire to learn, you do not have that that perseverance, which we're going to talk about, you're going to get left behind in this field and you're not going to be successful. So let's move over to perseverance. You have to have this perseverance mindset, not with just that desire to learn, but also that ability to not give up because the answer is not always there in front of you. And you're going to see this as we go through the course. It's not cut and dry. It's not, hey, I scan for this. I see an exploit. I go exploit it. You might have to do a lot of research. It might look like the machine that you're attacking. It has no exploits available to it. And you have to be able to put in that persistence to be able to persevere. You have to have that mindset where I'm not going to give up. I'm going to keep trying at this until I have exhausted all my potential resources. That is what makes a good hacker. Okay, that that mindset of I'm not going to quit really makes a good hacker. Now, on top of that, non complacency, this kind of falls into that strong desire to learn. Now, I've had coworkers that are completely happy when I was working help desk when I was working in networking, plenty of coworkers who are happy with their jobs, they've been in the same position for five years, 10 years, you cannot be that person if you want to be a pen tester. You always want to learn more. You always want to move up. You want to you want the most out of yourself. OK, don't be complacent. If you're complacent, you're going to get left behind. Just 
I, I'm beating the dead horse here, but it, it really is true. Like you're going to get left behind if you're not constantly studying and if you stay complacent. Lastly, you should have a blog or a Twitter or s- GitHub or something that you contribute back to the community with. It could be a YouTube channel or a Twitch stream or however you want to do it, right? You should give back to the community. When I see that somebody's giving back to the community on their resume, even if it's a blog post or Twitter, whatever, it really helps. Uh, and things that you're going to get asked in interview include where you get your news from or and how do you, you know, do you have a blog? You're going to be asked that, you know, and Twitter is a great place to get get news and uh, a blog's a great place to give back. And Twitter is a great place to give back, too. So make sure you're contributing to your community. It'll really help you in the long run. And you don't have to reinvent the wheel. It could be a blog that somebody's posted before or 20 people have posted before. As long as you're posting it and you're, it helps you learn and it helps your style might be something that helps somebody else learn as well compared to the other blog posts where maybe people didn't like that writing style or they didn't like that you know commentary or however it is. So you never know how your content is going to help somebody else. So I always encourage people to go out there and make their own content. So that's it. And I know this is a long video. This is going to be longer than most of the videos, but I wanted to dive in and really cover what you can expect as an ethical hacker and what you need really at a technical and a soft skill level to be successful. So from here, we're going to go ahead and get right into the course. Next up is effective note keeping. We're going to talk about the importance of note keeping, what tools you should use to be keeping notes for this course, and then we're going to dive right into the technical concepts. So I'll catch you over in the next video.